Hello, my friends, and welcome. Uh, welcome to another edition of Uncle Henny's Campfire Stories, where we are going to hang out together live, and I'm going to read some spooky stuff, uh, and we're going to, you know, just have a good time. Um, let me get logged into the chat. And uh, real quick, I want to thank Ray Searcy and Craig Cohen for tipping before the show even started. Uh, Ray Searcy and Craig have become, they, they started basically battling it out for who can, who can tip earliest. And Ray uh, tipped before 4.30 this afternoon. So I guess she wanted a, uh, a guaranteed win there. Um, but hello, my friends. Uh, Jeff McClellan said, yay, story time. You better believe it, Jeffy. Um, and Dwayne West said, hello, my friend, ready to get spooked. Shane Migliavaca said, spooky time. Craig Cohen said, hello, Henrik. Good evening. Good evening to you, sir. I had a pretty eventful day. Uh, I went to the veterinarian, uh, at 2.30 and had the staples taken out of my dog, Henwolf. She's recovering well, but unfortunately, um, the back of her neck where she had one of her incisions opened a little bit. So I had to take her back to the veterinarian and they stapled her neck shut and gave me some antibiotics just to be safe. Um, but Henwolf is doing fine. She is napping in the hallway as she likes to do. So, uh, no big worry there, but woof. It, uh, it took it out of me for a second, made me very, very nervous, uh, just trying to make sure she's all good. Morgan Moore said, stories and a nice drink, it's definitely spooky night time. You better believe it is. And today we're going to be continuing our dive into still more scary stories for sleepovers. So uh, for those of you who are listening and watching right now who have never listened or watched before, this show is family friendly. Uh, there will be no swear words, there will be no um, innuendo, and all the books we read are technically kids' books, although they may be a little bit on the uh, more young adult side of things. So, without further ado, I say we get to the uh, the first story, and uh, in between we'll be hanging out. Also, uh, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, tipping is appreciated, but not required. Uh, but what I do require from you is hit that share button, and tell people to join us. Uh, it helps a lot and I appreciate it. So, let's see what we got to start tonight. This story is called The Storm. Clay Davis opened the map. I think we missed the turnoff, Dad. He looked up at a sign as they zipped past it. I think we should have gotten off about a mile back. Clay's mother turned from the front passenger seat and pointed to the map. May I see that, please? Clay refolded the map and handed it to her. She studied the map for a moment in the failing afternoon light. He's right, she said finally. Oh, great, Jessica, Clay's older sister, groaned. She looked out at the gray, leaden sky uh, as raindrops began to splat against the windshield. Now we're never going to get... <clears throat> now we're never going to get there, she whined. Who picked this old inn in the middle of the boondocks anyway? You did, everyone chimed in. Oh, right, Jessica grinned sheepishly. I thought it would be romantic. It's almost a century old. Yeah, Clay said, and if we don't get there soon, we'll be a century old. Don't worry, their dad said as he maneuvered the van into the right lane. We'll take the next exit and double back. More than an hour later, after several wrong turns and some rough roads, Mr. Davis guided the family van over a rickety bridge across a rain-swollen stream. Through the trees, a small village came into view. In the drizzling rain and gathering darkness, the scene looked eerie and uninviting. The stores lining, <clears throat> the, stores lining the main street were all closed. The village appeared forsaken. Jessica was the first to say what everyone else was thinking. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. That... Traveler's Rest Motel back by the expressway didn't look so bad. Maybe we should stay there. I'm afraid we don't have a choice, Mr. Davis looked down at the glow of the gauges on the dash. We don't have much gas left, and it looks as though that closed gas station over there is the only one in town. Besides, I don't think it would be smart to drive around anymore on these back roads in the rain. Let's just try to find the inn and stay for tonight. If we don't like it, we can leave in the morning. 
The rain pelted the windshield. No one spoke as Mr. Davis inched the van down the empty, dismal main street. Clay had the strange feeling that the village wasn't deserted at all. He squinted out into the gloom of nightfall, certain that someone out there was watching them pass. A cold chill made him shiver. You know what it means when you shiver? Jessica said. It means that someone in the future has just walked across your grave. Clay elbowed her painfully. No, it doesn't. It means, look, there's a light, Mrs. Davis interrupted. That must be it. Through the heavy rain, they could see a dim glow a few hundred yards up on a hillside. Mr. Davis turned at the next corner and headed up the slick hill, then parked. A sudden flash of lightning crackled across the sky, and for a moment the landscape was bathed in a ghostly light. An old Victorian building was hunched against the forested hillside. Dense clumps of trees and bushes seemed to be pressing in and around the inn, as if they were trying to push it from its unsteady perch. Mrs. Davis took a deep breath. Well, there's no sense sitting out here in the rain. Let's make a run for it. Clay slipped his arms through the straps of his backpack. Last one in is a drowned rat, he yelled, slamming the door behind him and running through the pelting rain toward the lighted porch. Laughing, he clambered up the wooden steps and under the shelter of the overhang. When he turned to watch the rest of the family struggle across the muddy path, something at the corner of the building caught his eye. A figure? A girl? Slipped from the edge of the porch into the darkness. But that was impossible. Who or what would go out into, a su into such a storm? Still, something about what he had seen seemed oddly familiar to Clay. Suddenly, he became aware of his dad behind him, holding open the door to the inn. Come on, son, this is no time to daydream. Clay moved toward the door, taking one last look over his shoulder. Shrugging, he stepped inside and was a little startled by the light. The entry hall was warm and cheerful, not what he had expected. A pleasant, gray-haired woman in a crisp, flowered dress greeted them. Oh, good heavens, she declared. This is not any sort of night for anyone to be traveling. Come in, come in, there's a warm fire in the parlor. I'm Mrs. Reese, Ellen. Welcome to Dark Acres Inn. I'm afraid we didn't think you were going to make it tonight, so I don't have dinner prepared, but I can put together a warm snack in no time. A snack sounds great, said Mrs. Davis, but could we go to our rooms first and change out of these damp clothes? Oh, gracious, yes. I did prepare rooms just in case. Three, right? My husband will get you settled. Albert, she called. Our guests have arrived. Albert, a tall, kind-faced man with a head of thick white hair, sauntered in and helped the Davises with their bags. Do you have a granddaughter? Clay asked. The man tilted his head. No, what, uh, what makes you ask? Clay motioned toward the door. When I was outside, I thought I saw someone step off the porch. I thought maybe it was your granddaughter or something. The two old people glanced at each other quickly. Clay noticed Mrs. Reese nervously fingering the lacy collar of her dress. Sometimes the lightning can play tricks. It can make you think you see things that aren't there. Mr. Reese picked up some luggage. Now it wouldn't be hospitable for us to let you catch cold. Just follow me and we'll get you all set. He guided them along the hallway and opened the door to three rooms. If you don't like these, you can take your pick of the rest, he said pleasantly. There's no one else here. These rooms will be fine, said Mrs. Mr. Davis. We'll join you and your wife in the parlor shortly. Once Clay was alone, he dropped his backpack onto a chair and unzipped it. He pulled out a dry sweatshirt, jeans, sneakers, and socks, but he didn't change right away. Instead, he clicked off the light and stood at the window, staring out into the night. Outside, tree branches tossed violently in the rising wind. Lightning flashed. No one could be out there on a night like this, he whispered to himself then switched the light back on and quickly changed clothes. But when he looked into the mirror to comb his damp hair, he froze. In the reflection, he could see the window behind him. The sad eyes of a pale young girl gazed steadily in at him from outside. Slowly, she raised her tiny, clenched hand and began to knock on the glass. Clay dropped the comb and whirled around to face the window. But now, there was nothing but a wind-whipped branch beating against the glass. Another flash of lightning lit up the empty scene, and Clay bolted out of the room and headed down to the parlor. As he reached the entryway, he slowed down. How would he explain what he had seen? 
He didn't want everyone to think he was just a scared kid. Maybe it was just a trick of the light. By the time he joined his family and the Reese's, Clay had almost convinced himself that nothing had happened, until he saw Jessica's face. She kept glancing at the French doors, which appeared to lead to an outside terrace. Clay's dad smiled at him. What took you so long? Mr. Reese was just telling us all about the area. There's a dam up at the top of this valley with a lake behind it. If it stops raining tomorrow, maybe we can go up and have a picnic. Sounds great, Dad, Clay answered, but like Jessica, he couldn't stop looking at the French doors. They seemed so fragile. If there really were something outside, those doors didn't seem strong enough to keep it out. Clay accepted a sandwich and a steaming cup of hot soup from Mrs. Reese, then sat by the fire near his sister. As the adults continued their conversation, he whispered to her, Did you see something strange tonight? Wide-eyed, she looked at him. No, well, not exactly. That, that is, it wasn't that I saw anything, but when I was in my room, I had this spooky feeling that I was being watched. I don't like this place. Did you see anything? Clay decided not to make his sister any more frightened than she was. No, he lied. It's just weird here. Jessica's hand shook as she reached for her cup. This place is so old. Do you think it could be haunted? Her gaze flickered towards the French doors. I feel like we're not as alone here as we think. After they had eaten, the family retired to their rooms. Despite the strange happenings, Clay soon fell sound asleep. But whatever was haunting his waking thoughts seemed to have found its way into his dreams as well. At first, his dream was pleasant. He was in a field near the inn on a warm summer day. He could feel the sun on his face and hear the laughter of a young girl. She began to sing a familiar song, but after a moment or two, the song turned to a kind of moan, almost like the sound of the wind. The moan rose to a cry, a cry for help. He tried to reach the girl, but the ground turned to thick mud. He was sinking deeper and deeper until finally he couldn't breathe. All the while he could hear cries and sobbing, but they were cries of many people, people in terror. Clay sat up fully awake and gaped out the window directly into a pair of mournful eyes. Once again, he saw the ashen face of the girl he'd seen earlier. She opened her mouth as if to speak, but Clay heard only the crash of thunder. But the girl curled her fingers at the base of the window, trying to open it, and then her eyes met Clay's again. As if still in a dream, Clay felt the need to do what the strange girl wanted. He kicked away the blankets, rose slowly, and moved toward the window. The girl's eyes glittered as Clay touched the metal latch. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning lit up the sky, and Clay saw that there were dozens of people outside in the storm. They were all dressed in turn-of-the-century clothes, and they were moving toward the inn as if their feet weren't quite touching the ground. A tremendous crack of thunder drowned out Clay's scream as he backed away, turned, and raced into the hall. He screamed again as he crashed into his sister. She was shaking violently. There's something out there, Clay. I saw them too. We've got to get Mom and Dad. He flung open the door to his parents' room but it was empty. Clay and Jessica ran down the hall. Relief washed over them as they saw their parents sitting in the parlor. But their relief lasted only a moment. When Mr. Davis looked up, his face was strained. Mr. Reese was twisting the dials on a radio, but all it was receiving was stratic, stra static. Come on in, kids, Mr. Davis motioned to them. You might as well know what's going on. It seems that all this rain has weakened the dam. There have been reports on the radio that everyone down below has been evacuated, but the stream has flooded out the road. There's no way we can get out. He smiled to reassure them. But Mr. Reese says we're on high ground and shouldn't be in danger. Mr. Davis studied Clay's face, then Jessica's. There's something wrong. What's the matter? Clay glanced at his sister. We saw something. People outside. They were dressed weird like out of history books. They were all around the inn. Mr. Reese shut off the radio. Mrs. Reese finally broke the silence. It's them, Albert. They're here for us. What is she talking about, Mrs. Davis demanded. Albert Reese rubbed his eyes and smoothed back his hair with both hands. Nothing. It's just an old story. Tell them, Albert, or I will, the old woman said. 
Mr. Reese began speaking, slowly. This isn't the first inn to stand on this site. There was another one before the flood of 1885. A fine man and his wife ran it. They had a little girl and boy. Those kids were never apart. They came. Then came the storm. It was as bad as this one, or worse. The townsfolk down below were worried about the dam. Word is they took shelter up there, but it didn't do them any good. Mrs. Reese walked to the fireplace. She took down a photograph from among the many on the mantelpiece. Mr. Reese continued the story. Seems the dam did break, and it was worse than anybody thought it would be. The water raged down this valley with a vengeance. It washed away the end. Nobody survived. He sighed heavily. Some folks think that when people die violently like that, they don't rest. Some folks here in the valley say that when it rains, they can hear the moans of the dead on the wind. But those were good, hard-working people. I don't see why they'd want to harm anyone. You're not telling me you believe in ghosts, Mr. Davis asked, surprised. I grew up around here, the old man answered. There have been times when the rain was real bad and the wind howled through the trees like, well, I'm not one to scoff. This is the family that owned the inn, Mrs. Reese turned the photograph to the others so they could see it. It was of a man and a woman in turn-of-the-century clothes. Seated in front of them were a boy and girl holding hands. Oh my goodness, Jessica gasped. Clay, the boy, he looks just like you. Clay said nothing. He stared at the face of the girl. It was the same face that had gazed in the window at him. A bolt of lightning cracked. Seconds later, the thunder shook the inn as if they were trying to pound it to the ground. The lights went dead, leaving the parlor lit only by the flickering fire. A tremendous gust of wind crashed open. The French doors and rain poured in, but no one moved to close them. Standing just beyond the entrance was something that had once been a little girl. Her dull blonde curls hung limply around her pale face, and her sodden dress was streaked with mud. A few yards away on either side of her were others who appeared to have shared her fate. The girl's eyes were locked onto Clay's as she raised her hand and motioned for him to follow her. Without thinking, he began to walk toward the doorway. Clay, no! His mother grabbed at him, but he quickly slipped into the downpour. The wind ripped at his clothes and the rain drenched him, but he was no longer in control. He had to go with her. Slipping and sliding in the mud, he struggled up the hillside after the phantom girl. We've got to stop him! Clay! His mother screamed. Come on, Mr. Reese said to Mr. Davis. We'll stop him. The two man, men ran out into the downpour. At that moment, the front door of the inn slammed open. Seeming to float just above the ground, several figures entered and drifted toward the parlor. Jessica shrieked, Mom, what are they? What do they want? In terror, she clutched at her mother. Mrs. Davis picked up a lamp from the table and threw it at the specters, but they kept advancing. The air became thick with the smell of damp earth and mildew. We've got to get out, said Mrs. Reese, shaking with fear. She snatched a blanket from the arm of the couch and threw it around Jessica's shoulders. The two women and Jessica ran into the storm after the others. Driven by fear, they climbed higher up the slick hillside. Far above, Clay stumbled to his knees. He tried to get up again, but realized that something had him by the ankle. The rain had eased and the sky had begun to lighten with the approaching dawn. Clay looked down and saw that it was his father who was gripping him tightly. No, Dad, he squirmed. Let me go. I I've got to go to her. Suddenly, Clay heard distant thunder, and at the same time he realized that the ground was shaking. The roaring grew louder as Mrs. Reese, Mr. Mrs. Davis, and Jessica scrambled up the hill. Seconds later, a raging wall of water tore through the valley below. It ripped up trees and sent boulders flying. The mud-choked waters fell upon the inn like a savage beast and ripped it to pieces, carrying away what was left. The six people huddled against the hillside, safe from the deluge. The phantoms stood below at the edge of the water. As the day grew brighter, they faded into the flood, one by one. Saints pre preserve us, Mrs. Reese said, holding on to her husband. If it hadn't been for them, we would have been in that building. Clay looked up at the fading form of the girl above him. She held out her hand and smiled. He reached out and brushed her fingertips just before she vanished.
Thank you, he whispered, hoping that she could hear him. Ooh! I feel like that is one we haven't had, we haven't had happen yet. Um, a, uh, misunderstanding where the ghost is actually trying to help. Which is a pretty classic trope of, like, are you afraid of the dark? Which, you know, obviously I love. So let's see what you guys are saying in the chats. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Shane Migliavaca, for your tip. Very much appreciate it, my friend. I'm glad you're enjoying the spookies. I know you picked up a few of your own scary stories for Sleepovers books. They are a lot of fun and generally not a lot of money to get. So, uh, but let's see what you guys are saying in the chat room. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, Kitty Coakley said, hi, Henrik. Long time no see. It has been a very long time. Uh, Morgan Moore said, so we're adding general stores to the don't ever go to list. Yeah, does anybody have like a definitive don't ever go to list that these books have given us? It's like, don't ever go camping. Don't ever go on vacation. Don't ever go to the store. Don't ever buy a plant from Africa. There's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> Shane Migliavaca said, it means another angel got its wings. <laughs> Heather Fairchild said, hey guys. Hey, hey. Uh, don't trust the old woman. These stories have taught not to trust the elderly. Shane, you were actually wrong this one time. Keith Tomlin said, and that's why I spend my vacations at home, drinking alone. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Uh, Heather Fairchild said, kind of a weird coincidence that I'm currently binge watching 13 Reasons Why, and there is a character named Clay and one named Jessica Davis. Uh, Jessica Randolph said, they survived. Wow! Very rare occurrence when we're reading scary stories for sleepovers. And Dwayne West said, very unique with an unexpected twist. I loved it. I That twist worked for me. I thought that we were about to have some kind of an undead smackdown, and then it turned out that they just didn't want those kindly folks to drown. I also like the old worldness of um, of old Mr. Reese saying, like, those were all good, hard-working people. Why would they want to hurt us? It's good stuff. Mm. I need that cold water right about now. So, I'm glad you all enjoyed that one. Um, yeah, it looks like tonight we'll be getting, we'll be probably completing still more Scary Stories for Sleepovers, which means we have two books left in the Scary Stories for Sleepovers uh, canon to read. Unless you count the Scary Stories Almanac, which I do have right here. Um... But it's a little different. And also, issue or number 10 of Scary Stories for Sleepovers, I do not have because, unlike these books, it's about $50 or $60 just to get that a copy of Scary Stories for Sleepovers number 10. So I have one through nine, and each one of them cost me between four and six dollars. Um, so I'm debating it right now. Um, but, you know, if we, if we were to raise 60 or $70 in tips tonight, I could be convinced uh, to uh, to buy it. So anyway, <clears throat> but uh, let's uh, let's move on to another story. All right, let's see what we got next. This story, my friends, is called Homecoming. The call of an owl woke Timothy. It took a long time for him to draw himself from sleep. When he did, he was groggy and confused. He licked his lips. They were dry. His tongue felt thick and clumsy. He blinked at the darkness around him. Why was it so cold? He reached for the blankets to pull them around his shoulders, but all he managed to grasp was a handful of dry, crackling leaves. With great effort, he sat up and looked around. It was easy to see that he wasn't home in bed. He had been lying on the clout, on the cold, hard ground. Wind-blown leaves were scattered across his bare legs and feet, and a few had lodged themselves in the tatters of his clothes and tangles of his uncombed hair. His hair, why was it so long? And why is it so cold for a summer night? Where am I? He said aloud. The sound of his own voice startled him, and he felt the first pangs of fear crawl up his spine. Who, who? The hoot of the owl that had wakened him made him jump as he twisted around to find where it was coming from. Low in the branches of a nearby tree, a pair of round eyes glowed in the moonlight. Who, who? It called out. 
Then another glint of light caught Timothy's attention. Painfully, he stood and shuffled toward it. His legs were stiff and he felt the cold down to his bones. He tried to move quietly, afraid of what might be waiting on the other side of the branches. Finally, he pushed aside a scraggly twig and stepped into the open. Stretched in front of him were the dark waters of a lake. A wide, rippling ribbon of moonlight cut across the center of it. Timothy could hear the water lapping gently on the shore, and a light, chilly breeze stirred the leaves on the ground around him. It also stirred a memory. The lake, he said to himself. We were playing... Sandy, where are you? he called. She was his cousin, and they had been playing near the water. His mom had asked them to be home before dark. Home! A sharp pang shot through Timothy's heart as he thought of his home and of his room with all the posters of sailboats. That was why he was here. He and Sandy had come to the lake to test out a new model boat that they had built. The boat had drifted off, drifted off and they had followed it along the shoreline, trying to catch up to it. By the time they had found it, trapped in a tangle of bushes overhanging the water, the setting sun was turning the sky a deep, dark red. Timothy could still hear the sound of his mother's voice warning them. Now don't stay out too late, she had said. I don't want you to making a, I don't want you walking home in the dark. Aw, oh, come on, Mom, he had grumbled. What are you even worried about? I'd know my way through the woods even if it was pitch black. What did I just say, Timothy? She had said sternly. Be home before dark, okay, okay. He'd agreed reluctantly as he ran outside to meet Sandy. Take an apple with you, he remembered his mom calling after him. You'll get hungry out there. And his mother was right. He was hungry. Very hungry. But it wasn't an apple that he wanted. It was something else, something he couldn't quite think of. His mother had also been right about how dangerous it was to stay out after dark. Somehow Timothy had gotten lost. And Sandy, where was she? Timothy recalled standing on the lakeshore with her as the sun sank below the horizon. It's getting dark, he said. We'll have to get home faster if we cut through the woods. Sandy had shaken her head. No, Timmy, I really don't want to. It's too creepy. You're such a scaredy cat, he had made fun of her. They had been, they had been close for, a long, for as long as he could remember. When Sandy's parents were killed in a car accident, she had come to live with Timothy and his parents. They were a lot alike, except one thing. He didn't really mind the dark, and Sandy was afraid of it. Really afraid. She was certain that ghosts, werewolves, and vampires actually existed. Timothy thought of how frightened she had been when they had first headed into the trees. Now he was sorry he had made fun of her, especially since he didn't know where she was. Somebody must be looking for us, he said to no one. He looked up and down the moonlit shoreline. They're probably looking in the woods. I'll just cut through and head home. They probably found Sandy. Now they'll find me. He babbled on and on to himself as he rambled toward the trees, their leafless branches forming a dark tangle of shadows. He walked into the dense forest. The echo of his footsteps made it sound as though there were things slinking through the woods. The wind softly rocked the bare branches above and seemed to whisper a warning. Go back. Go back. But Timothy forced himself on. Some buried thought kept nagging him. But all he could think about was how cold he was and how very, very hungry. Maybe Sandy was nearby, all alone and frightened. He stopped and called her name. A rustling noise came from somewhere in the dark behind him. Was it her? He strained to hear, but again, there was only silence. Then, out of the corner of his eye, Timothy caught a glimpse of a pale glimmer. He snapped his gaze to a clump of trees just ahead. A memory stirred. That was when, that was where they had first seen the woman. Timothy felt his insides twist in fear as he thought of her. She had been standing in a shadow, staring at them. Sandy had noticed her first. Timmy, she had cried out. Look, someone's there. Timothy had tried to put on a brave act. Maybe you were right, he said to Sandy. Maybe we should go back and walk home along the shore. The woman had moved toward them. 
as she'd stepped from the shadows, Timothy had seen her face and gasped in horror. She was as pale as chalk, but her eyes were gleaming like blood-red coals. Her lips were curled back in a hideous grin. Timothy would never forget the sight of the gleaming fangs that protruded from her mouth. Run! Run for the lake! He screamed at Sandy, pushing her ahead of him. Timothy remembered racing through the woods in terror. He could still feel his heart pumping, the bushes scratching at his legs. He could still feel himself tumbling as his foot caught on a fallen branch. He had landed hard and had the wind knocked out of him. The last thing he remembered was watching Sandy running away, and for a moment he was angry at her for leaving him. For just a split second, Timothy felt that he wanted to pay her back for leaving him alone in this horrible forest of tall, scary trees. The trees, Timothy gasped. He looked up in realization. The summer leaves were gone. Why hadn't he noticed that before? How long had he been out there? He began to run. Was that horrible woman still out here? He had to get home. He was so cold and terribly hungry, and the shadows, they crouched on every side as though they, cl they cloaked some secret horror. Timothy forced his feet to move. From all directions, he could hear the rustling of a dry leaves stirred by the cold wind. He imagined blood-red eyes as <clears throat> watching his every step. He was not alone. He could sense it. Suddenly, he burst from the forest into a clearing. Down the hill and to his right, he could see the lake again. It was a dark tongue of water with lights glittering at its tip, the lights of town and home. Timothy stumbled down the slope, but as he neared the familiar place, he felt a growing sense of dread. Without knowing why, he stayed in the shadows. He was becoming more at ease in the dark, and the cold no longer bothered him. When he turned onto his own street, he noticed that the houses were strung with colored lights. It was a holiday of some sort, but that didn't seem important. All that was important was the gnawing hunger that was growing in him with each passing moment. There were no colored lights on his own house, but there was a warm glow coming from the front window. Someone was home. Timothy no longer felt any fear. He moved quietly toward the window and peered in. The light hurt his eyes. Sandy was at the edge of the couch near the fireplace, her head resting on a pillow. Her eyes were closed and a book lay across her lap. For a moment, as Timothy stared in at her, he again felt a moment of hunger, but the feeling was soon replaced by hunger. He had to eat. Soon. He slipped his thin, pale fingers under the window and pushed, and it slid up easily. Then, soundlessly, he pulled himself up to the ledge and eased over the windowsill. The room felt hot and stuffy. He wanted to escape into the safety of the cool night. That horrible gnawing in his stomach was relentless. He needed to eat something. Leaving a trail of dried dirt and leaves, he scraped across the floor to stand behind his cousin. A lock of her hair was draped across her neck, and he gently pushed it away. Her eyes fluttered open. Sandy, he moaned hoarsely. I'm home. Sandy's eyes widened in terror. No, oh, no, she screamed. It can't be, you're... Her eyes rolled up and she became limp. Timothy gripped her neck in his chalk white fingers. It was so warm and he was so hungry. He drew back his lips and ran his tongue over his sharp teeth. It's good to be back, cousin, he snarled. Then scanning the room, Timothy noticed a photograph of himself. The frame was draped in black with an inscription that read... In loving memory. He smiled slightly, touched by the sentiment. You'll have to forgive me if I eat and run, he said, baring his fangs and sinking them into his cousin's neck. Outside the window, a woman with blood red eyes watched. Very good, my new little friend, she whispered. Very good. That was cool. I like that one a lot. <clears throat> Let's 
Let's see what you guys are saying in the chat. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Keith Tomlin, for the uh, generous uh, contribution. I do appreciate it. Uh, da, da, da. Shane Migliavaca, how many of the books have you read those through so far? Um, I believe that if I have two left, I this would be the seventh one I read. I think that that's accurate. Yeah, this is the seventh one that I've read. So, and I have two more ready to rock. <clears throat> and three more if you count the almanac. Um, let's see, Morgan Moore. These also, there are also spinoffs of the books, novels, and more mystery-themed versions. That is true. I've looked into them a little bit. I bought one of the novels. I think it's actually right here. Oh, wait. Oh, this is a different one. I bought this one out of curiosity. This is called Tales from the Midnight Hour. Not quite a spinoff, but a similar vein. <clears throat> so, let's see. Katie said, hi, Hen. Hello. Kevin Edward Rose said, time for new glasses. I read, I read that as a night of scary stories with friendly fascists. Not quite accurate, my friend. Michelle Antisocial said, I feel bad for this poor vampire kid. I do too. Uh, Rebecca Randolph said, ooh. And Shane McGliavaca said, cool vampire story. I agree. Um, I have not, I have yet to hear a story where uh, it was all about uh, figuring out what had happened in the past. That was a pretty fun way to go. Um, and of course we hadn't had a vampire before, so that alone is pretty exciting. So let me just checking my, uh, <clears throat> the stream's still going. My computer is saying like that, it, that something's up with the stream, but I think we're okay. Uh, Alex Harker said, hi, hi, Alex. How you doing? Hope you're doing very well. So let's see. It looks like everything's fine. It's still streaming, so I'm not going to worry about it. <clears throat> All right. Let me just get my throat in order, and we'll do another one. That was fun. I feel like we've only had vampires like two times out of like seven books. So, what's next? And still scary, more scary stories for sleepovers. The next story... Ooh, I like this title. Oh yeah, Heather Fairchild said, unless you count aquatic vampires. We did have those rad aquatic vampires a couple weeks back. That was pretty dope. Alright, so this story is called Portrait of Evil. Andrea had always dreamed of having her own house, horse. <laughs> now her dream was almost coming true. She wasn't going to own a horse, but at least she was going to spend a whole summer at a ranch. Her aunt Joanne, <clears throat> Joanne and Uncle Charles had agreed that she could stay with them while her parents were in Europe. Andrea loved staying with her aunt and uncle. There was always something fun to do at the Red Mesa Ranch named for the tall, flat-topped cliffs that rose along the, coat, the east edge of the ranch. Uncle Charles raised horses, and her Aunt Joanne was an art collector and an artist. Now, looking down from the window of the plain, as the late afternoon shadows deepened across the mountains and desert below, Andrea was filled with excitement. Once in the terminal, she found her aunt and uncle waiting at the gate. Aunt Joanne was all smiles. We're so glad you're finally here, she exclaimed. Me too, Andrea grinned widely as she gave her aunt and uncle a hug. A half hour later, Uncle Charles pulled the van onto the wide dirt road that led to the ranch. Instead of going straight to the house, though, he headed toward the corral. I have something I want to show you, he said to Andrea. As, she, as he stopped the van next to the fence, a young boy led a beautiful bay mare into the corral. Is she for me? Andrea said in a tiny voice. She sure is, Uncle Charles laughed. Her name is Monterey. Why don't you go over and let Jesse introduce you? He said and gestured to a tall, thin boy holding the reins. We'll take your bags up into the house. <clears throat> Andrea gave her aunt and uncle huge hugs, then raced into the corral. Hi, she said, grinning at Jesse. He appeared to be only a little older than she was. I guess you're Jesse. I'm Andrea. 
Do you take care of the horses? He smiled back at her. Sort of. My dad is the foreman here. I help out when I don't have school. You're so lucky. I just love horses. She gently petted the mare's neck. This is going to be the best summer. Maybe I'll even take my first ride after dinner tonight. Andrea noticed Jesse's smile falter. You'd best wait until the morning. It isn't safe. What do you mean? She asked. Why isn't it safe? He looked out toward the desert, engulfed in shadow. In the distance, the first lights were twinkling in the town. The desert may look empty, but it isn't. There are things out there that are better left alone. I'll put Monterey in the barn, then I'll walk you to the main house. At dinner that night, Andrea asked Aunt Joanne about the strange thing that Jesse had said. He seemed nervous. Is something wrong? She asked. Aunt Joanne ran her finger slowly over a pattern in the tablecloth, as if she were thinking about something. Then she finally spoke. About 200 years ago, this valley was part of a Spanish land grant, a man named Don Ramon Hildago. Apparently, he wasn't a very nice person. Uncle Charles broke in. That's putting it mildly. It seems he brutally ended the lives of a number of people, including his own sister. He also reportedly dabbled in the sorcery. Anyway, he was finally hanged, but the people around here are superstitious. They blame anything bad that happens on Don Hildago. Of course, it's nonsense. Jesse's just being foolish. Charles, Aunt Joanne said sternly, Jesse's lived here all of his life. These legends are a part of the land, and you must admit that lately there have been some accidents. I think we should take his concerns seriously. Oh, really? The corner of Uncle Charles' mouth turned up in a half smile. You think that we have anything to worry about from old Don Hildago? Then why do you, uh, <laughs> why do you have him hanging in your studio? What? Andrea explained, exclaimed. No, no, dear, Aunt Joanne laughed. He isn't hanging. It's just a portrait of him. She lifted one eyebrow and looked at her husband. It's from the original Hidalgo collection. I found it in a gallery in Albuquerque just three months ago. I also found some old books that belong to the infamous Don Hidalgo himself. They're in the library. I'll show them to you sometime if you like. But enough about this. I made a special dessert and it's time to serve it. After dinner, Andrea helped to clear the table, then asked to be excused. She wanted to take a look at the portrait of Don Hildago in her aunt's art studio. She had expected a somber picture of a man standing alone. She had expected a, a... But the portrait was very large, and there were at least a dozen people and several horses in the painting, too. She studied the scene carefully. Her eye was drawn to the man at the center of the group. Looking at him made her shiver. There were deep lines around the mouth that gave him a hard, cruel look. The cold, dark eyes lacked any trace of humanity. The next morning, Andrea was at the corral before breakfast. Jesse helped her saddle Monterey, and then he saddled his own horse, Thunder, and guided Andrea on a riding tour of the foothills. Finally, when they were riding toward home, Andrea asked Jesse about the legend. My aunt told me the story, she said. It sounds weird. Why are people still frightened of a dead man? Jesse sighed. For 200 years, this valley has suffered. People have died in strange accidents or have simply disappeared. All the while, strange sounds and lights have come from the Hildago mansion, even though it was supposed to be deserted. Finally, the house was torn down and the things in it were sold. For a time, it seemed that the curse had ended. Then about... Three months ago, a little girl disappeared from a local campsite. A month later, another child vanished. They haven't been found, and last month, the Peterson home burst into flames in the middle of the night. No one got out. Andrea's thoughts were racing. Did you say the first little girl disappeared three months ago? She asked. Jesse nodded. Yeah, why? The painting, she murmured. That's when Aunt Joanne brought home the painting. As soon as she got back to the ranch, Andrea went straight to her aunt's studio. In the morning light, the face of Don Hildago looked even more grim. She studied the other figures. There were several children. 
One of the women was holding a little girl with curly blonde hair who looked very out of place. There was something about the little girl's clothes that bothered her. For a moment, Andrea thought of telling her fears to Uncle Charles, but that seemed silly. It was just a painting. It couldn't have any effect on the real world. Andrea had planned to ride again in the afternoon. Jesse was in town with his dad, but she felt comfortable with Monterey, and so she set out on her own. She was an excellent rider and guided Monterey easily to a rise looking for the val overlooking the valley. The view was beautiful. She rode for several miles, then decided to head back while it was still light. Gently tugging on the reins, Andrea <coughs> coaxed Monterey into a wide turn. That was when she noticed the other horse. It was standing alone near the edge of the cliff, a beautiful silhouette against the afternoon sky. Strangely, though, it seemed to be staring right at her. Then it started to move toward her. Andrea made a clicking noise and urged Monterey to trot. The black horse increased its speed and began to close the distance between them. In alarm, Andrea loosened her grip on the reins. Monterey sensed her command and leapt forward into a full gallop. Desert sand flew up in huge chunks as Andrea's horse seemed to fly across the ground, trying to outdistance the pursuing stranger. The black horse was cutting across to it at an angle toward them, forcing them to ride along the cliff. Eyes wide with fear, Monterey galloped closer and closer to the edge. Andrea leaned into her horse's body and tried to match her movement. Still, the black horse was closing the gap. Monterey's hooves dislodged rocks. Avalanches of sand and pebbles careened down the steep sides of the ledge. The black horse was almost on them. Andrea could hear its deep, heaving breaths. She could hear, she could see its flaring nostrils and the splash of white on its forehead. With a final effort, Monterey twisted off, twisted away from the cliff to safer ground. Andrea suddenly became aware that they were no longer being followed. She pulled up on the reins, tossing her head. Monterey slowed and stopped. They were alone. Andrea could see for miles around, but the black horse had disappeared. Jesse met Andrea as she rode into the corral. What have you been doing? This horse is exhausted, he said angrily. I know, Andrea gasped. We were chased by a strange horse up near the rise. It tried to force us over the cliff. A strange horse? Jesse asked. Why would a horse chase you? Andrea shook her head. I'm not sure, but I think I've seen it somewhere before. It had a white blaze on its forehead. Look, Jesse said, holding the reins as Andrea slipped from the saddle. You shouldn't go off riding on your own. Your aunt and uncle would be very upset. Andrea set her mouth in a firm line. I have to check something. Will you take care of Monterey for me? Moments later, she stood before the painting in her aunt's studio. It was just as she'd remembered. The black horse with the white blaze was standing in the background. There was only one difference. Now, as nightfall came upon the ranch, the horse's coat appeared to be glistening with sweat. Uncle Charles was in the library reading the afternoon paper. He looked up when Andrea knocked, the <clears throat> knocked at the open door. I know you won't believe this, she began slowly, but please listen. I think that the accidents that have been happening, the disappearances, I think they all have, to do with, have something to do with Don Hildago. Now Andy, her uncle frowned. There's certainly something serious going on here, and everyone is worried, but it's a job for the police. It doesn't do any good to start blaming someone who died almost two centuries ago. Andrea's gaze fell on the paper in Uncle Charles' hand. At the top of the page were pictures of the two missing children. He may be dead, Uncle Charles, Andrea said earnestly, but Don Hildago isn't gone. Please, come with me and bring the newspaper. I, I want to show you something. Reluctantly, Uncle Charles followed Andrea into Aunt Joanne's studio. To his amazement, he too saw that the little blonde girl in the painting resembled one of the pictures in the paper. The painted face of another child seemed to look vaguely like the second missing youngster. I don't know what's going on here, Uncle Charles said worriedly, but I think the sheriff should take a look at this. He picked up the phone and punched in a number. Andrea listened as he asked for the sheriff, then left a message. He slowly hung up the phone and turned to Andrea. 
there's some trouble over at the, Men the Menendez place. The sheriff may not be back for a while. We'll have to wait. If he doesn't get back to us tonight, I'll reach him first thing in the morning. Andrea awoke to a frantic knock on her door. It was Aunt Joanne. She was trying to control tears and the shaking in her voice. Andy, honey, there's been an accident. Andrea knew immediately. It's Uncle Charles, isn't it? What's happened? I don't really know. It's so crazy. He wasn't around when I got up this morning. At first I didn't think... She began to sob. If only I'd look for him sooner. He must have been out there half the night. Where, Aunt Joanne? Andrea demanded. What happened? Where's Uncle Charles? Her aunt managed to speak. There's a dry well on the side of the house. It's been boarded up for ages. Charles knew it was there, yet somehow he, he fell into it. Tom, Jesse's dad, found him this morning. He's badly injured. The ambulance is here, and we're going to take him to the hospital in the city. I have to go right now. Andrea could barely breathe. I'll go with you. No, honey, you can't. Please just stay here in the house, where you're safe. I'm sorry to leave you like this, but there's no time. Tom will be in the bunkhouse. I'll call you as soon as I can. Aunt Joanne whirled and raced from the room. Andrea watched from the window as the ambulance pulled away. As soon as she was alone, she ran to the studio. The painted face of Don Hildago was twisted into a hideous grin. She stared at it in terror. Right before her eyes, it seemed to shift its gaze to her in triumph. Andrea thought about Uncle Charles fighting for his life. You haven't won, she yelled at the painting. I'll find a way to stop you. For the next few hours, she combed through the books in Uncle Charles' library. She found one on the history of the valley. It told of, of, Ramon, <coughs> of Ramon, Hildago, men, is, <coughs> Ramon Hildago's many crimes. There was another book, too, an old leather-bound volume about witchcraft and sorcery. Andrea read the fading print on its yellowed pages and slowly hatched a plan. She brought a can of gasoline from the barn and carried it to the studio. Her parents had taught her the dangers of handling such things, but she felt it was her only choice. She struggled to get the huge painting from the wall and dragged it to the oversized fireplace. All the while, she talked to the painting. I'm going to stop you once and for all, she said. Now all I have to do is just wait a little longer. When the afternoon had begun to deepen into the twilight, into twilight, Jesse knocked, on th knocked at the door. I thought you might like some company, he said. Have you heard any news? Not yet, Andrea said. Then she whispered, but I'm glad you're here. I need your help. She took Jesse by the hand and telling him what she had learned about the painting, she led him toward the studio. As long as Don Hidalgo has a link to the living world, he can hurt us. We have to destroy the painting after nightfall. That's when the painting can change and is most vulnerable. Jesse never even questioned her. Andrea opened the door to her aunt's studio and together they stepped inside. Jesse! Andrea almost screamed. Look! He's not there! Moonlight streaming in from the glass doors of the veranda revealed an empty space in the center of the painting. As the children watched, a shadow fell across the canvas. Slowly, they both turned to see the figure of Don Hildago standing in the doorway behind them. His eyes were seething with hatred as he slowly spoke. So, you thought you would end my time here on earth? You stupid mortals. You do not have any idea of the depth of my power. But I do, Andrea answered bravely. Without the painting, you're nothing. She held up a package, <clears throat> a package of matches in her trembling hand. The hideous creature threw back his head and laughed. Then he scowled wickedly at the matches, and the entire pack suddenly flared in Amanda's hand. She screamed and dropped the burning pack, then lunged for the can of gasoline by the door, but Don Hildago turned his gaze to it, and the can exploded into bits. Then he lifted his hand, and somehow Andrea went slamming into a wall. Breathless, she sank to the floor. Jesse charged across the room at the fiendish phantom, but it stopped him in his tracks. Don Hildago's unblinking eyes held Jesse's much the way the eyes of a snake hold the gaze of its victim. Don Hildago reached out and wrapped his icy fingers around the boy's throat and squeezed. Darkness flowed over Jesse in waves, and he could see the face of one of the figures in the painting taking on his own features. 
No! Andrea screamed. Struggling to her feet, she grabbed a bottle of fluid from her aunt's supply table and threw it at the ghastly creature. The bottle missed him, but hit the painting and shattered, drenching the canvas with a clear, smelly fluid. Don Hildago stared at the painting in disbelief as the colors began to run together. His grip weakened, and Jesse felt air rush back into his lungs. Andrea raced to her friend's side as the strong smell of turpentine filled the room. Are you all right? she gasped. But Jesse motioned toward Don Hildago. He was running his fingers through the oozing colors as if, they, as if he were trying to put them back where they belonged. Then his body began to sag. His entire face was hanging and dripping streams of flesh. Opening his formless mouth one last time, he howled weakly in defeat. Then everything was silent. Come on, Andrea said, helping Jesse to his feet. Let's call the hospital. I have a feeling Uncle Charles is going to be all right now. For a moment, all was still. A shaft of silvery moonlight reached the puddle on the floor, and slowly, the colors began to swirl. Then gradually, deliberately, they flowed across the empty canvas in bold strokes, and a new portrait began to take shape. A new portrait of evil. Pretty fun. I like haunted artwork. I think haunted artwork is a is a fun concept. <clears throat> oh goodness, my throat. All right, let's see what you guys are saying. A little bit more water. Sometimes it takes a minute to load. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Morgan Moore said, so evil horses? Not quite. Uh, <laughs> Leah, uh, Heather Fairchild said, Leah Henry said, scary horses. Morgan Moore said, the stories are rather home destructive tonight. Yeah, they kind of are. Jamar Calhoun said, did they imagine the ghost horse? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I took the, the ghost horse as the horse from the painting permeating itself in the real world to cause horrible accidents and kill people so that they can also end up in the painting. Kind of a, you know, makes its own gravy kind of thing. Uh, Shane Migliavaca said, these stories always have interesting setups. They do. I, that's one of the reasons I love not just these books, but I love, you know, late... Uh, in the game horror movie uh, uh, sequels, because I always want to see like what they come up with to try not to repeat themselves. You know, sometimes books and stuff like that they do repeat themselves over and over and over again, but sometimes they really don't. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you guys remember when we read uh, books eight and nine, but they were like astronomically different from the books we'd read before that. Whew! All right. So. Let's see what we got next. And uh, please remember, tipping is appreciated. It is not mandatory, but it is very appreciated. So, hey, the book's fighting me. <clears throat> there we go. This story, my friends, is called All the Time in the World. The Tyrannosaurus Rex was definitely the most ferocious of the meat eaters. It was huge! Kara spread her arms as wide as she could to make her point. David shook his head. Just because a dinosaur was the biggest of its kind doesn't mean it was the meanest. The two friends were sitting cross-legged in David's room. Dinosaurs and ancient mammals of various types glowered down at them from posters on the walls. One very large book was open on the floor between them. David had borrowed it from a next, his next-door neighbor, Aiden Alden. Pound for pound, David said firmly, some prehistoric mammals were a lot tougher than dinosaurs. Alden told me. Like David, Alden loved prehistoric creatures. He was a grown-up, but he didn't really act like one. During the day, he drove a delivery truck. At night, he stayed up until all hours working on weird inventions in his basement. Kara leaned over David and peered into the book. 
Okay, which ones were tougher than dinosaurs? David pointed to a picture of a heavy-fanged, cat-like beast, but he was interrupted by a knock. His father opened the door and leaned in. David, your mother's asked for you almost an hour ago to go next door and clean up the mess in Alden's driveway. I suggest you take care of it now before it gets dark. Aw, Dad, I didn't make the mess. Why don't we just let Alden clean it up himself? Because it was your dog that tipped over his trash can, David's mom said as she stepped into the room. Besides, Alden isn't there. I went over the day before yesterday to give him a package that, he had, that had been delivered here by mistake. He didn't answer the door. He wasn't there this morning either. He's, maybe he's away on a trip and forgot to mention that he was leaving. You know how forgetful he can be. Come on, David, I'll help you, Kara offered. The two children collected a broom and dustpan, then went outside and surveyed the mess. What is all this junk? Kara asked. The driveway was strewn with bits and pieces of cable, wire, graph paper, and what looked like tiny electrical parts that had been fried to a crisp. Alden is working on a new project. He's been fooling around with it for a couple of months, David said, picking up a handful of papers and dumping them into the trash. Usually he likes to show me his inventions, but this time he's being real secretive about it. I haven't seen him at all in more than a week. Maybe mom's right. Maybe he's on a trip. Do you think something's wrong? Kara asked. David furrowed his brow. I'm going to see if his car is here. I'll be right back. A moment later, David returned. Aiden's car is here, all right. Maybe we should take a look inside the house. Maybe he's sick or something. The kids went to the front door and rang the bell. There was no answer. They tried the back door, too. Then David noticed that the window next to the door was open slightly. He slipped his fingers under the windowsill, pushed it all the way up, and climbed inside. Kara hesitated. I don't know if we should do this. We're not going to do anything wrong. We're just checking to see if Alden's inside. David said, a little annoyed. Maybe he fell down the stairs and needs help. If we save him, we'll be heroes. The idea of being a hero seemed like a good one, so Kara hoisted herself up over the windowsill and into the kitchen. P.U., she wrinkled up her nose in disgust. The place was deserted. Dirty dishes were in the sink, and a carton of milk had been left out on the counter. This place is kind of spooky, Kara whispered. Let's hurry up and I'll look in here, <clears throat> she said, stepping into the living room. Suddenly, a low growl issued from somewhere in the shadows. Kara froze. A deep voice boomed out. Stay right where you are. I've got you covered. Don't shoot, Kara pleaded. David just laughed. Oh, I forgot. He walked into the living room and flipped a switch on a tape player on the bookshelf. Look, he said, pointing to a wire that ran from under the carpet where Kara was standing. It's Alden's version of a burglar alarm. Within minutes, the children had checked the upper levels of the house, but Alden was nowhere to be found. The last place to check was the workshop in the basement. Wow, Kara said as they started down the basement stairs. A counter and shelves ran around the entire room, and everything was cluttered with machines, tools, and parts. This place is great. Look at this stuff. What does it all do? Most of it doesn't do anything. Alden isn't a very good inventor, David explained. Hey, that's new, he pointed toward a large object in the center of the room. It looked like four round platforms piled on top of one another, creating a series of steps. A post about three feet high was in the center. There were lights all around the post, and it was topped with what looked like a small television screen. The kids climbed up onto the upper platform and studied the switches and dials. It must be some sort of vehicle, David guessed. Let's find out, he flicked one of the switches. Yeah, Kara grinned and flicked a few more switches. All at once, a purple light came on around the rim of the bottom step and bathed the entire floor in lavender. Awesome, Kara flicked another switch, and wide green beams of light shot out from the second platform. Then a low humming sound came from the post. Another switch sent streams of blue light in every direction from the third platform. Finally, David touched the uppermost switch. Red beams from the fourth and final platform flowed upward, and the children were enclosed in a curtain of ruby-colored light. The post on the screen whirred to life. It was a digital counter of some kind. 
Kara's face whitened as the machine began to vibrate. David, I don't think I like this. Shut it off! David pushed the switches, but they were all locked into position. I, I don't know how, he shouted. The counter continued to whirl, and the humming sound grew louder. I thought you knew all this stuff. What if this is a bomb? Do something! Kara yelled at the top of her lungs. Abruptly, everything became quiet. The red, blue, and green lights turned off, leaving the room glowingly silent in an eerie lavender light. The children looked around. Aside from the light, everything looked the same, except the digital counter on the screen. It read, One Million. It turned itself off, David said. I guess everything is okay. Maybe we should... But he was interrupted by a loud, fierce roar, followed by what sounded like heavy footsteps coming from outside. What was that? Kara's voice was shaky. David tried to be calm. It's probably another one of Alden's stupid burglar alarms. Let's go see. Kara shook her head. Uh-uh. I don't think so. Come on, we can't stay down here. Besides, it's getting really hot and stuffy. I need some air. Reluctantly, Kara followed her friend up the basement stairs. At the top, David gripped the doorknob. It was warm to the touch. David turned it and slowly opened the door. A wispy tendril of fog snaked into the room. The two youngsters stood in the doorway, their mouths wide open. The house, the neighborhood, everything they knew was gone. Instead, they seemed to be on some sort of highland. To their right, the land sloped down sharply, flattened, and stretched into a barren plain all the way to the horizon. Where are we? Kara whispered. David looked closely at the trees and plants crowded outside the door. From the looks of these plants, I think the question should be, when are we? This looks an awful lot like a kind of place that would have existed a couple of million years ago. He was finding it hard to breathe. Wait a minute. Maybe this isn't really happening. Maybe we're just imagining it. The machine probably gives off some kind of gas that makes you think you're somewhere else. It's possible that if we just step out of the room and take a few deep breaths, everything will be the way it was. Do you really think so? Kara asked. Do you have a better idea? The two moved cautiously through the doorway and out a few feet into the strange forest. Behind them, the door was a glowing purple blur. Breathe in deeply, David instructed. They each took several lungfuls of air. I think it's working, Kara cried out. The trees are starting to quiver. Look! All at once, low branch, <clears throat> a, all at once, a large low branch was flung to one side and they were staring into a huge bear-like face. The beast reared up, towering at at least 15 feet tall. Each of its massive paws sported long, sharp claws that were curved like scythes. The animal took a heavy step forward, placing its enormous body between the children and the door. David gasped. It's... it's a megatherium. Kara was trembling all over. She spoke in a low undertone. What does that mean? It won't hurt us. It's a plant eater. Does it know that? Kara moaned, backing away. In a rapid move, it swiped at them with a giant paw. Kara took another backward step and slid down the side of the embankment, embankment in an avalanche of loose rock. David, she screamed. He raced after her, gripping her by the arm before the, she reached the edge of the drop-off. Come on, he panted, helping her to her feet. We've got to get back to the... But he didn't finish. His eyes were wide with fear. Their escape was blocked by something deadly. Crouched on a rock above them, was what looked like a lion, except that its lips were drawn back in a snarl that revealed an arsenal of teeth unlike any lion of the modern world. Protruding from its upper jaw were a pair of glistening fangs as long as daggers. David tried to speak. Kara, he murmured hoarsely, we've got to make a run for the forest. But the creature seemed to second-guess the two children and lunged for them just as they made their break for the shelter of undergrowth. With the beast on their heels, Kara started to clamber up into the limbs of a tree. Climb up. Clamber? No, it says clamber. <laughs> no! David screamed. It can reach you there! We've got to find a place to hide that's too small for it to get into! There! 
He pointed to an outcrop of rock about 50 yards away. They reached it in seconds and scrambled in among the, the boulders. I don't think it's followed us up here, David gasped. Tell me I'm crazy, Kara groaned. But wasn't that one of those things in the book we were looking at? Yeah, a uh, saber-toothed cat. A smilodon, a smilodon, David wheezed. He wiped the sweat from his eyes and leaned out from their hiding place to survey the surroundings. I think it's gone. So we can... Ah! Without warning, a figure leaped out from behind another boulder and pulled David to the ground. He struggled out of, from underneath the weight, grabbed a small rock, and lifted it to strike the attacker. No! Kara yelled. It's a person! David stopped and stared at the figure on the ground. It was Alden. He was badly battered and bruised, and, but, and he was very pale. His left arm hung limply at his side at an odd angle. Alden, David gasped. Alden, what? But before the man could speak, they heard a throaty snarl. David and Kara pulled Alden further into the safety of the rocks and leaned him against a boulder. He looked pretty bad, but he tried to smile. David, Kara, am I, am I glad to see you? You didn't happen to bring anything to eat, did you? David fished into his jacket pocket and pulled out a squashed candy bar. He unwrapped it and put it to Aiden's right hand. Aiden held it tight, but he didn't attempt to take a bite. David noticed that several of his teeth were gone. How'd you figure out where I was? Who figured out how to use the machine? Who else is with you? The badly injured man asked in short, breathy gra gasps. Nobody's with us, David answered. We were looking for you and we saw the machine in the basement. We just wanted to see what it did. Then suddenly we ended up here. Alden groaned. <sighs> the machine must still be preset for the... <coughs> for the place of... Pleistonian epic epoch. I was testing it, he said, wincing in pain. The only way back is through the door. Each time the passage is opened, it remains open for one hour unless you close it down from the machine. If you don't get back through it, you won't survive long in this time period. As if, it, as if to make the point, something in the forest growled menacingly. Okay, David said bravely. The door isn't far. We can carry you between us. We'll make it. Alden shook his head. You won't get back unless you can run. There are things in the forest. He touched the terrible gouges in his arm. They come out of nowhere. We know, Kara said. We ran into the Smilodon. That's how, far, that's how we got this far. Alden curled one side of his mouth in a bitter grin. It isn't one cat you have to worry about. You could probably outrun him and hide, but the dire wolves, they're bigger and faster. They work together in packs. Worst of it is, they're smart. They're responsible for what happened to me. Weakly, he held up his torn arm, then let it drop. The pack is still out there. It's too late for me, kids. I'm out of time. Alden drew in a shallow breath. You go on alone. It's the only way. David started to protest, but Alden cut him off. There's no more time to discuss it. Now go! David touched Alden's shoulder, then looked at his watch. We have 15 minutes, Kara. Let's go for it. Kara and David moved as fast as they could through the undergrowth. Soon they could see the purplish glow of the door. When they were only a few yards away, David heard a rustling behind them. Then his eye caught sight of a dark shadow then another, moving among the trees. It's the dire wolves! They're surrounding us, he yelled. The kids took off as fast as they could, crashing through the leaves and twigs. Kara tripped, and as she regained her footing, she looked over her shoulder. Four vicious-looking animals were racing toward them. They all had savage claws, and their dripping jaws were lined with flesh-ripping teeth. One of the wolves was close enough to make a try for its prey. Snarling, it leaped into the air, snapping its jaws. Kara thought her heart would burst, but she made a final effort and vaulted forward. She crashed into David, and they both tumbled through the doorway. For a moment, the terrified children stayed perfectly still at the bottom of the stairs. Finally, Kara whispered, I think we made it. Are you okay? David nodded. At the top of the stairs, the purple glow faded. David looked at his watch. We just made it. Let's reset the machine and go home. 
Moments later, Kara and David slipped back out of Alden's kitchen window. Poor Alden, Kara murmured. I wish we could have helped him. Thank goodness that's over. David suddenly turned back to the gate. It isn't over. When we came through the time passage, we opened it up for another hour. We have to go back down and close the channel from the machine. Something might be able to get through. The kids raced back through the garden and in through the kitchen window. As they stepped into the darkened living room, they heard a low growl. It's just Alden's stupid tape, David said. Come on. But in the darkness, they didn't see the two massive creatures crouching by the basement stairs. Two fellow time travelers with razor-sharp teeth. All right, I feel good on that one. <laughs> Woo! That was fun. My voice is getting a little raw, so I do apologize. So let's see... Let's see what you guys have to say. Thank you so much, Morgan Moore, for your generous tip. I very much appreciate it. I'm going to put that in the uh, buy number 10 uh, uh, fund to get uh, scary stories for sleepovers number 10. <clears throat> All right, let's see what you guys said. Uh, Michelle Antisocial said, we're not going to do anything wrong. We're just breaking into this here house. <laughs> Shane Migliavaca, this book has had a different flavor compared to the previous ones. Yeah, a bit. I would say so. It's definitely established a, uh, a, a different vibe. Uh, oh, dang, it's the Dharma Initiative. <laughs> Alex Harker said, bring on the dinosaurs. <laughs> Shane Migliavaca said, and that's why you don't mess around in Doctor Who's workshop. <laughs> uh, Tony Janot said, hi, Henrik. Hey, my man, how you doing? Well, my friends, I say we do one more because I think that's all my voice is going to allow for. Um, and then, of course, I'll be back next week with another uh, another dose of scary stories for sleepovers. But let's do, uh, let's do one more after I numb my throat. Uh, tastes as good as it should. <laughs> all right. Let's do one more, my friends. Everybody lean in real close. This story is called Household Help. I hate homework, and I hate softball, and I hate school. Hannah threw her books on the table counter and slumped into a chair at the table. Claudine, the housekeeper, was busy making dinner, and the noise made her jump. Hannah's mom looked up at her from her own books spread out across the tabletop. She was studying for night class she was taking at the community college. I know how you feel, honey, she said. Sometimes it seems like there's so much to learn that you'll never get it done, but you have to keep trying. Is there anything I can do? Hannah grunted. Not unless you can pitch and hit. I wish I were like Stephanie Lake. She's the best pitcher in the, t the team has ever had. And she can hit, too, Hannah frowned. But then she doesn't have to do a makeup report for science class. She doesn't have to work hard at anything. I'm sure that isn't true, Hannah's mom said. But you'll never get anywhere feeling sorry for yourself. You have to take control of things. She stood up and gathered together a few papers. Look, I have a test tonight, and I have to get ready for class. Tomorrow's Saturday. Maybe after the game I can help you with that science report, okay? And good luck with your game. I know you'll do great. She kissed her daughter on the forehead, then left. Claudine brought Hannah a glass of milk. This will keep the hunger away until dinner, she said, smiling. Claudine was a pleasant, grandmotherly woman. She had come from <clears throat> she had come to work for the family when Hannah's mom had started school three months ago, and she took her job very seriously. Thanks, Claudine, Hannah said, putting down the empty glass. You always seem to know exactly what I want. Claudine smiled. I take pride in doing my job well. While I am working for a family, while I'm working for a family, I'm very loyal to them, and I believe it is my duty to do everything in my power to take care of them. She emphasized the word power. What do you mean? Hannah asked. The housekeeper glanced toward the door and lowered her voice. I don't want to see you unhappy. If you are, that means I'm not doing my job well. It's important to me that you get what you want. 
Perhaps I could help you with your softball. You see, I have these special talents. Hannah was a little confused. You play softball? Claudine laughed. It was a twittering sound that made Hannah uneasy. Oh no, but I can help you anyway. Tonight, when your mom is gone, I'll show you. After dinner, Hannah's mother left for school. Claudine busied herself <clears throat> with the dishes. Hannah thought about what the housekeeper had said earlier about helping her, but she dismissed it. She was working on her report when Claudine knocked at the door of her bedroom. I'm ready, she announced. Out of curiosity, Hannah followed <clears throat> she announced. Out of curiosity, Hannah followed her to the family room. What's going on? the girl asked. There were candles lit on every table, and the room smelled perfumey. Step into the center of the room and sit down, Claudine commanded. This is really weird, Hannah said, and it smells funny in here. Still, she did as the woman instructed. While Hannah sat on the floor, the housekeeper walked around her, chanting. Finally, she took an object from her apron pocket. It was a small, odd-shaped root, and on and <clears throat> one end had a small ring attached to it. The root was strung on a thin cord that Claudine slipped over Hannah's head. You must wear this at all times, she informed the girl. Never let anyone, not even me, take it from you. But Hannah couldn't bear the idea of sleeping with this ugly thing on, so she didn't follow the instructions exactly. When she was getting ready for bed, she slipped the root off and put it on her dresser. In the morning, she saw the root lying there. Feeling a little foolish, she slipped the cord over her head and tucked the unsightly thing under her shirt. By the time she got to the park, Hannah had forgotten the silly ritual that Claudine had performed the night before. That is, until she stood at the home plate facing a pitcher. With two of her teammates on base, as the softball left the pitcher's hand, Hannah felt the root wiggle against her chest. The movement scared her and she jerked the bat. It came in contact with the softball with a resounding crack, and the ball sailed over the fence. In the stands, her classmates and their parents were wild with excitement. After the game, many people came up to congratulate Hannah on making the winning hit. She was really enjoying the glory when Stephanie Lake walked up to her. Good going, Hannah, Stephanie said. You couldn't have picked a better time to get such a lucky hit. Hannah scowled. What did Stephanie have to put it? Why did Stephanie have to put it that way? It spoiled everything. The night after di that night after dinner, while her mom was studying, Hannah slipped into the kitchen to talk to Claudine. The woman smiled broadly at her as she entered the room. See, my child? I told you I could help. Yes, Hannah agreed. You were right. When you said it was your duty to take care of us, you really meant it. Of course, the old woman said. Good, Hannah grinned, because now I have another problem. Oh, Claudine said warily. And what is that? It's no, it's no good making the winning hit if people think it was just luck. I want to be good at things all the time. I especially want to do things better than Stephanie Lake. Claudine raised an eyebrow and looked at Hannah. Just because a single piece of pie gives you happiness, it doesn't mean that you'll be any happier having the entire pie. The result might not be what you expect. You said that it was your job to take care of your family, Hannah said. Well, being better than Stephanie Lake is what I want. In fact, I want to make a fool out of her in front of everybody. It's your job to see that I get what I want now. Or what I want. Now, when do we do that circle thing? Claudine stared at her for a moment. That won't be necessary, she said finally. I'll be right back. A moment later, she returned with a tiny vial of liquid. Just rub this into the root, she instructed. You'll get what you want. As Claudine had promised, Hannah excelled in everything. As she, tr <clears throat> she tried at softball practice that Monday, the coach even let her pitch, and she struck out every batter. In fact, the coach promised that if she kept playing so well, she could pitch in the game on Saturday. When Stephanie stepped up to bat, Hannah made sure that she didn't get a hit. She threw the ball hard and struck Stephanie in the arm. You did that on purpose, Stephanie wailed. A large red welt was forming where the ball had walloped her. Come on, Stephanie, Hannah smirked. Why would I do that? It was an accident. 
You're just upset because the coach let me pitch. Hannah could see that Stephanie was trying to hold back tears. Hey, look at this, Hannah said aloud. Just because she doesn't get her own way, Stephanie's going to start crying. A couple of the other kids laughed. It was too much for Stephanie. She launched herself at Hannah. That's enough, the coach shouted, breaking up the fight. You're both sitting out Saturday's game. Are you satisfied, jerk? Stephanie muttered. Hannah set her, <clears throat> set her mouth in a hard line and glared at Stephanie as she walked away. Hannah didn't wait until after dinner to corner Claudine. She went straight home and marched into the kitchen. Claudine, she said angrily, I need you to really fix somebody. Child, the old woman said, looking deep into Hannah's eyes. Forget your anger and let it go. You wouldn't say that if you knew what happened today, Hannah declared. I know more than you might expect, Claudine answered solemnly. And I know that a trap set for prey can close just as easily on the hunter. I don't want to listen to any mumbo jumbo. You swore to take care of me and I want to get even with Stephanie Lake. Can you really make her suffer? I do not have control over what, ta over what takes place. I simply do my part to guide your own energies. It comes from you. Whatever, Hannah grumbled. Just take care of it. Claudine gazed at her, sadly. Bring me the root. When the ritual was finished, Hannah took back the root and placed it on her dresser where she kept it at night. She couldn't bear the thought of sleeping with it around her neck, even though Claudine had warned her to do so. The minute she got to school the next morning, Hannah could tell that something was wrong. She noticed that Stephanie wasn't there. As soon as everyone was seated, the teacher announced that something terrible had happened. Stephanie's mother had been involved in a serious automobile accident, and Stephanie and her family were at the hospital. The teacher said that Mrs. Lake would be, <clears throat> would be all right and that Stephanie would be in school the next day. For a moment, Hannah felt a pang of guilt. She hadn't meant for something like this to happen. It'll be okay, she told herself. Mrs. Poole said she'll be all right. When she got home, Hannah avoided going into the kitchen to see Claudine. She went straight to her room. The next morning, she woke up late. She dressed quickly and went to the dresser to get the root. It was gone. Mom, she called out. Did you take anything from my dresser? No, her mom called back. Is it important? Hannah hesitated. How could she explain what it was? It was nothing, she told her mom before leaving the house for the night. She would talk to the housekeeper when she got home. At school, Hannah saw that Stephanie was back. I'm sorry about your mom, Hannah said sincerely as she passed the other girl's desk. But Stephanie said nothing. She just glared up at Hannah. When it was time to read their reports, Hannah volunteered to do hers first. As she walked to the front of the class, she tripped over a book and landed flat in the aisle. Her classmates burst into laughter. Hannah's face burned red with embarrassment. When she looked up, Stephanie was crouched next to her, stone-faced, helping to pick up the scattered pages of Hannah's report. Then, as she handed the papers to Hannah, Stephanie whispered, This is only the beginning. She leaned forward to stand up, and Hannah saw a carved root on a cord slip out from under her sweater. Hey, that's mine, Hannah snarled. Not anymore. Stephanie sneered. After school, Hannah raced home from the bus stop. She burst through the front door yelling, Claudine! Claudine! When she bounded into the kitchen, she saw her mother at the sink, peeling vegetables for dinner. Whoa, whoa, what's all the fuss? Her mom asked. Hannah was out of breath. Mom, it's important, she gasped. I have to speak to Claudine. Well, you can't, her mom informed her. She isn't here. Isn't... Where is she? Hannah demanded. Her mother dried her hands on a towel and looked quizzically at her daughter. I was thinking of letting her go because I'll only have one class next semester. Then I heard what happened to poor Mrs. Lake. That's going to need help. She's going to need help for a long time. So I recommended Claudine. She left last night. I didn't have time to tell you, but it worked out just perfectly. Now Mrs. Lake has help and Claudine has a new family to take care of. <laughs> oh, I like that one. That was that was a nice twist. <sighs> Let's see what you guys are saying. 
Tony Janat said, I'm okay. I know what you mean about losing your voice. I was live on YouTube the other day for three hours. Whew, it takes a lot. I, I'm, I often resort to this spray, which helps numb it. <laughs> helps quite a bit. Um, Jamar Calhoun said, uh-oh, will that old woman turn out to be Satan? <laughs> uh, Tony Janot said, I'm pretty sure I'll be happy eating a whole pie. I mean, me too. I mean, same fam. Uh, uh, Keith Tomlin, there's no witchcraft. There's no witchcraft in baseball. Tony Janot, Hannah is turning out to be a female dog. Uh, Morgan Moore said, so when does she get her comeuppance? Oh my. And then Jamar Calhoun said, this actually sounds real familiar to a Tales from the Dark Side episode. That doesn't shock me because uh, Tales from the Dark Side was always good about bringing the comes around, goes around type deal. And there are only so many millions of ways you can give a bad guy their comeuppance before you run out of steam. So, um, but uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me on another excellent uh, Wednesday night. I will be back right here at eight o'clock next Wednesday. Um, and, uh, I'll be reading the remainder of still more scary stories for sleepovers. And then I'll be revealing what the next book we'll be reading will be. I have two options. Both are wrapped currently. I don't know which one is which, so I'll open it and it'll be random and exciting. So thank you all again for hanging out. Thank you guys so much for tipping, by the way. It really does make a difference. I'm not able to work very much at all. I'm hoping that that will change soon. But right now, yeah, I'm not really able to work very much, so the tips do help a lot, and I just appreciate you guys. So thank you again for another fun Wednesday night, and I will see you next Wednesday. So everybody take care and be scared.